Welcome to the Loins of History, a podcast about connecting history to current events. My name is Jay, and I'm joined by my co-host, as always, Colin. And this episode is episode two in our new series on a history of Chinese and U.S. relations. Uh, this this episode is going to be covering the second half of the 1800s. So, Colin, what are some of the main ideas that we should be taking away uh, today? Thanks, Jay. So, the first key takeaway I want to talk about um, is that Protestant Christianity is seen in a negative light today, but it had potentially good or at least neutral intentions, and it had a huge effect on rebellions later and immigration that occurred in the United States. Then I want to talk about the American involvement in China was not imperialistic in the sense of what we normally think of colonialism and the European powers being involved in other continents. It was much softer influence, if you will, uh, but you can't blame the Chinese for not viewing the US or viewing them as imperialists, basically. And then finally, within the United States, there is a growing a sense of anti-Chinese sentiment. It's still a sore spot to this day. And a lot of that had to do with Chinese immigrants coming in after the Taiping Rebellion and really influencing the labor market. So those are some key takeaways. But the theme that I want to talk about and connect all this to is that Western and specifically American influence is viewed as an attack on Chinese culture. So this conflict in this, this era of the century of humiliation is it's really a the Chinese view it as this attack on their culture, the culture that has lasted and they can trace their origins back to the third millennia BC. They view it as an attack on that and it's just an erosion. And it's this conflict that we as Americans just don't really understand. And we talked about it last week where the, the, the view of time and this, this is very recent still for the Chinese historically speaking, and it's still something they'd look back to. And uh, one of the quotes to kind of drive this home from Fang Gifen, sorry if it's not pronounced correctly, uh, G-U-I-F-E-N, in 1861 was, a great many of the foreign chiefs have learned a written and spoken language. The best of them can even read our classics and histories. They are able to speak on dynastic regulations and government administration, on our geography and state of our people. On the other hand, our officers from our generals down are completely uninformed in regard to foreign countries. Should we not feel ashamed? That was in 1861. So the sense of shame permeates even, even in this era. So it's not even looking back on it, but they're looking at it Currently, they feel this sense of shame that their culture, their identity has been subjugated. And when we talk about unequal treaties, that it's not one specific treaty. We talked about the Treaty of Wangsha last week, but there's a new, there's numerous treaties that occur over the next 60 years. And the Chinese refer to them, and we refer to them as well as the unequal treaties. And it's not just unequal because the trade terms were favored the U.S. more than the Chinese. They did. But the Chinese viewed it as unequal because these foreign powers came in and dictated to them what the terms were going to be. They were not viewed as an equal power, as an equal people. They were viewed as less than. So that's why they call it the unequal treaties. And it's something that has really stuck with them uh, into now the 100-year marathon, to quote uh, Michael Pillsbury, and what we're in today. So that's kind of the theme. And there are the takeaways. Uh, so we can dive right in. I, I really like that quote, Colin, because what I'm thinking about now is Samuel Huntingdon's Clash of Civilizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Samuel Huntingdon was a, was a great professor. Um, and in his book, The Clash of Civilizations, he wrote about like s differing cultures necessarily create conflict between one another. And, you know, after we talked about in our last episode, as the United States and Western uh, powers just began interacting with the Chinese, there were like, this is grounds that are ripe for misunderstanding, ripe for conflict for no other reason than we just don't understand one another. Mm hmm. Uh, in our in our three in our three kind of topics this episode, the American missionary movements, rebellion, and Chinese immigration to the United States. A lot of this is like Americans just wanted to you know do our thing in China, and the Chinese didn't take too kindly to that. <laughs> but then right. conversely. Like we can't look at the Chinese and go, oh, y'all are a bunch of racists. Like, because when the Chinese came to America, <laughs> we did the same thing. Now, granted, it, it was for completely different reasons. They had immigrated to the United States 
because the country was ter- China was tearing itself apart at the time. But they were not received well. So it's kind of interesting that we have these two dynamics of Americans are not being received well in China, but Chinese people aren't being received well in America. And I I think it just kind of vindicates Huntingdon's argument that differing cultures necessarily uh, clash with one another. Yeah, and to put it in perspective, that is a that was a great thought. And to put it in perspective, at the at this point in history, like I just said, the Chinese have existed since the third millennia BC. Europeans have, you know, the the British, the French, they've been on their own trajectory of cultural evolution for the past thousand years. So they, it's not like they interact like today. Hypothetically, if I had the funds and the freedom or the the schedule, I could I could go to the I could go get a ticket and I could fly to China. I could go to China. I could go on the internet right now and I can interact with somebody in China. So there's this cross pollination. There's this familiarity. Back then, it was if I want to go to China from Europe, I either have to spend months or potentially years going over land, and maybe may not even make it. And if I do, you know, by the time I get there, things have changed again. Or I can go over by ship and spend weeks or months on a ship and potentially not maybe not make it there. And so the interactions that we had were limited based on the distance. And then once you got there, it was like the only people that the Chinese interacted with, you know, in China were basically missionaries and soldiers and um, you know delegations on official um, US or European business. So it's not like they saw you know average Joe America working in. A factory, you know, the Chinese immigrants would later see them when they came over. But, you know, so that's part of the misperception of the Chinese. It's just a matter of time and distance at that point. Like they just couldn't, there was no cross pollination. There's no familiarity. It was so, it was so foreign back then. So Colin, can you tell us a little bit about those first American missionary movements? A little background on missionaries in China. You know, prior to the Opium Wars and this kind of opening of China, missionaries had extremely limited success in China. It was, you know, the Catholics had some presence there and, you know, most of it was done through trading. But prior to this event in the Opium Wars, like it was really limited, these coastal ports in these cities, very little success. Like it just didn't catch on in China. But after, um, you know, the the U.S. and the British began trading, or excuse me, the British started trading more. Uh, there was an American missionary who was the first American missionary in China named Elijah Coleman Bridgman. And he went to Guangzhou in 1830. And so he was appointed service in China um, by the American Board of Com- uh, Commissioners for Foreign Ministry Missionaries in 1829. He went and he learned the language because missionaries discovered that like, if you, if you can't speak Mandarin, uh, you're not going to be very successful. So he learned Mandarin. Uh, he learned and began translating the Bible and other, I guess, Western documents into Mandarin and started preaching. And he was able to penetrate further into the country. And so he was the first. And interesting fact, prior, after the uh, Opium Wars, though as a missionary, he wasn't acting on like official capacity of the US government. He did act as a translator, cultural advisor, if you will, to American ambassadors who came over there in order to negotiate the Treaty of Wangsha and kind of open up official relations between the US and China. So, But as a missionary, he did gain some success, went inland. Um, he got married and his wife opened up a school that they ran for 15 years. So he had some, he was one of the first one. And so then with the second great awakening, there was this renewed fervor for uh, missions within uh, the Christian community, especially Protestants and the rise of millennialism, um, this real drive and zeal for saving souls really took off. And so mission missionaries began getting funding from all these different societies within Western nations, especially like the US and the UK. So they went to China post Treaty of Wangsha and the Treaty of Wangsha and some of these other treaties gave them the ability to purchase land and I guess official backing in the sense that the government was going to support their rights to be there. As you can see, so, you know, prior to Elijah Coleman Bridgman, not a lot of success on the missionary front. He comes in, he begins to to penetrate deeper into the country. The Great Awakening increases um, the zeal and the fervor for missionary work. More missionaries pour into China. These official treaties allow them to be there. They learn the language and they start gaining a little bit of success. But in China, there was some pushback from more of the middle gentry level and the upper classes because it kind of conflicted with these Confucian ideals at which they sat on the top and they did not exactly like the idea of, well, everybody... 
Confucianism has this um, where you have to pay respects to elders and this hierarchy. So those that are in appointed positions above you. And Christianity was kind of different in the sense that peasants were saved too. Peasants um, had certain inalienable rights and this kind of Western honestly, for the time, quote unquote, progressive idea that, yeah, everybody's actually equal. And once yeah. you're a Christian, everybody is a Christian and there's no like real hierarchy. And so that conflicted with these Confucian ideals and the upper classes and the gentry didn't really like that, but it did gain some momentum with the peasant classes in China. There's two schools of thought with the impact of missionaries in China. So the first views these as like an instrument of Western imperialism. So we talked about the three M's, uh, merchants, military, and missionaries. So this third M, the missionaries, the negative view stems from kind of this clash of cultures and they view it missionaries as this agent of erosion, eroding culture for the Chinese. So, you know, they really believed in this, these Confucian ideals. Now you bring in Christianity and it suddenly kind of subverts that and Go, does away with it. And they argue that it actually led to this kind of re rebellion, the spirit of rebellion and this sorry, re typing rebellion. Mm -hmm. And it sowed the seeds for that. And it just created this cultural erosion. So the Chinese now look back very unfavorably. And at the time, a lot of the upper and middle class looked at it unfavorably because they viewed it as an affront to their culture. Um, but the other school of thought yeah. views this as um actually some benefit. So the American missionaries came to China and like peasants were not really treated well in China necessarily. Um, a lot of the impression that Westerners got upon coming to China and making their way inland was that it was kind of a backwards country. The industrial revolution hadn't really taken off. So, uh, you know, peasants were they had some functional literacy, but a lot of them were illiterate. Um, you know, we think of China in the mm -hmm. classics as being very well educated, a lot of advances in science and technology and astronomy. A lot of that had kind of gone away toward the later Qing dynasty. And American missionaries were able to translate new documents, um, scientific documents, educational um works. Actually, Elijah Coleman was a member of, and he became the joint secretary for the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. Basically, th they existed. And there's a really interesting kind of society. Their whole goal was to spread education for free. Um, you know, like in the UK chapter, John Stuart Mill was a member. So they had some high class, um, high powered in intellectuals who were part of these societies. Um, so they would bring documents and missionaries would translate them into Mandarin so people could read. They set up schools and hospitals that mm -hmm. existed for a long time and provided services that the average and peasant classes in China, China did not have. So the other way to look at it is like, hey, they actually did do a lot of good and they really weren't acting on behalf of the U.S. government. Yes, the U.S. government did back them and their right to be there, but that's different than them acting in an official capacity from the U.S. government receiving dictates to say, hey, you're going to go to these people and get this is your official U.S. government messaging. No, they came and said, Right. You know, we believe, um, you know, following the Great Awakening, we believe this is our mission for from Jesus Christ. This is what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to spread. The American government is just allowing us to be here. Big difference. Right. Didn't Chairman Mao say something about Christian influence? In, yeah, uh, in he, he did. So this, like is, this was this had this had a lot of scar tissue in their country. It, it did. And we're about to get into some of the Taiping Rebellion, which that's that's part of the huge uh scar that's a huge piece of the scar tissue but it's kind of all rolled in together and um actually Karl Marx and Mao Zedong of course both had things to say about it so Mao Zedong said mm -hmm. for a long period US imperialism laid greater stress than other imperialist countries on activities in the sphere of spiritual aggression extending from religious to philanthropic and cultural undertakings takings. So right there, that kind of falls into the first school of thought, like, well, you know, the culture of China, it's very intertwined with these Confucian ideals. And Confucianism is not a religion, so to speak. It's more of like an ordered life, like, a, you know, Buddhism was very popular at the time. But like Mao Zedong looked back at this and these American missionaries as destroying the spirit of China. Like he's coming in and taking thousands yeah. of years of religious 
uh, evolution, I guess, and, and identity, like the Chinese identity is interwoven with Confucianism. And then they're coming in and saying like, no, 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 um, that's actually wrong. And, you know, like some of the things like foot binding and um, like universal education were brought in by missionaries. And even though I think now we would say those are good things, um, as a matter of fact, I think the Chinese government would also agree with universal education and, and uh, being anti foot binding, but right. like the Chinese at the time didn't believe right. it. And they, it was an affront to them. <clears throat> and then that's what Mao Zedong believed. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to see. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's funny. I didn't know this until, um, a couple years ago, but anti-imperialism is a distinctively communist talking point it, in its in its origin. So, you know, rewind to the 1800s when imperialism was was full swing. No, there, like nobody was really criticizing it except the communists. And it's funny that it, we tend to forget that because now we kind of even on the liberal side of things. And I don't mean like. You know, here in the United States, we associate lowercase l liberal with like the Democratic Party. I mean, more like capital L as an ideology liberal uh, side of things. Um, uh, we don't like we know that imperialism like, yeah, we probably shouldn't have, you know, just taken people's territory from them, exploited all their resources and their people and left them in states of misery. Like you, that's an extreme. But uh you know, imperialism is generally bad, but back in the 1800s, the communists were really the only ones talking about imperialism, specifically the Russians, like the, the, uh, Marxist Leninist movement, which was a distinctive brand of Marxism and communism. And if you think about it, it was because the Russians, Russian imperialism was interesting because it looked woefully different, woefully different than like British and French imperialism, where they would you know sail their navies around the world and take all this territory. So we we have here Chairman Mao going for a very long period. U.S. imperialism uh, mm -hmm. laid greater stress than other imperialist countries on activities in the sphere of spiritual aggression. So Mao is actually adopting two different ideologies to form his singular worldview. And it is both a distinctively Chinese and communist uh, worldview. He's already predisposed as, as a, uh, as a Chinese person to not, you know, not want um, outside influence like foreign influence, but because he's also a highly motivated and dedicated communist, he views it any kind of foreign influence as imperialism. So specifically, like I, I guess I'm, it's interesting to me that he ties American missionary movements to imperialism. And I and I hope everyone listening like understands the nuance that American missionaries in the mid to late 1800s was is looked and is fundamentally different than like conquistadors showing up mm -hmm. in central and south america like they just that's not the same thing um uh, and but to the point of if you're mao zedong or if you're from china you don't understand that nuance like you don't look at oh you know these are just nice christians who are trying to build schools and hospitals they don't understand the nuance so they go like they're imperialists. <laughs> well, it, you're right. And it's partly, I think, because this coincided with Elijah Bridgman came there in 1830. Ten years later, it was the Opium Wars. The Opium Wars began. So it's kind of, and, you know, that's when the missionary, the amount of missionaries kind of flooded in. So that this all coincided with this basically an embarrassing defeat to the British. And then suddenly, like, these missionaries are coming. So it's kind of hard to uncouple those things that, like, yeah, even though. Right. Like it's just very difficult. And actually, Karl Marx, um, he wrote in the Daily Tribune like in um, 1853. So this is actually getting into the Taiping Rebellion, which we'll get to in just a second. But, you know, he said the revolution, uh, he wrote uh, revolution in China and in Europe, quote, before the British arms, the authority of the Manchu dynasty fell to pieces. And simultaneously, 
trade and financial penetration by the European powers occurred in ways that were almost fatally deleterious to the Chinese economy and polity. Forced opium trade led to a rapid depletion of Chinese silver reserves and the forced availability of English textiles led to a severe dislocation for Chinese textile workers. He looks at the point where the British Navy came in and just smashed the Chinese Navy to pieces as like a point where like mm-hmm. imperialism came in. So Karl Marx views like these Westerners coming in as like, this is imperialism. This is the, f- the start of this rebellion. And it's funny, Mao Zedong said like he views the American missionaries who didn't come in with guns. They didn't come in with this show of force, but they almost view them as the same thing. So like one of them was a, a physical embodiment right. of warfare and imperialism. The other one was a spiritual and they, they just can't uncouple those two. They, they are one thing. Hey, that's actually a really good segue into the Taiping Rebellion. So Colin, what was the Taiping Rebellion and how, how does it impact US-Chinese relations today? The Taiping Rebellion is something that I had never studied in high school, I, you know, in college and these history classes. It's not something yeah. that Americans really know about, despite it being like- Never the heard most, of it. Yeah, never heard of it. <laughs> it. Despite it being one of the most deadly rebellions in history. You know, when you talk about uh, how many people died, like how long it actually lasted, um, you know, for context, this lasted like 14 years. Yeah. The American Civil War lasted four years. And um, a lot yeah. more, you know, a lot more people died in the Taiping Rebellion than the American Civil War. Um, so the Taiping Rebellion began when there was a, um, so for context, post of opium wars, there was famine, there were droughts, um, increased taxes. Obviously, what Mark said, like the silver reserves were depleted. Like this is a bad time in, Qing, in the Qing Dynasty. There's also ethnic conflicts between the Manchus, the Hakkas, the Han, Chinese. And there's just a breakdown in trust between the, the Qing Dynasty and the, especially the peasant class. Um, and the Qing Dynasty and the, ru- the current rulers were basically viewed as impotent. Um, these Westerners were coming in and basically enforcing their will on the Qing dynasty. So that was embarrassing at a national level. The economy is in ruins more or less. Um, and we're being mistreated and we're at the bottom of the barrel. So there's a civil servant um, named Hong Zhuquan, and I'm, I'm sure I mispronounced that, but he was a civil servant. Uh, he came from a poor, um, a poor village in Guangdong, Guangdong and uh, one day he had a nervous breakdown while he was um, basically taking his civil servants test, the equivalent of it back then. He had a nervous breakdown and dreamed of heaven. Um, and in this vision of heaven, he spoke to mm-hmm. the, the father and he was told that um, basically uh, they were worshiping, the Chinese were worshiping demons and he was guilted into this, you know, he, they were believing false idols and they were leading people astray. So he decided to um, come back and start preaching that he had seen the father and he had seen Je- uh, Jesus Christ. He actually also said that he met Confucius in heaven later, uh, but he proclaimed himself the brother of Jesus, mm. Jesus Christ. And he began uh, good this for re- him. Yeah. Good for, yeah. Good for him. <laughs> Didn't work out well for him or any of his followers, <laughs> but um he, you know, he started this rebellion, and in 1850, they actually defeated the Qing army um, in December of 1850. Um, and then from 1850, so December of 1850, this defeat of the Qing through um, 1864, um, they lead a rebellion that ha- ends up with over 20 million dead. Dead. So 20 million dead. That is a massive. Death toll. You think? I think we said that the Chinese had in China. There's 400 million people. 20 million of them died, predominantly in southern and southeast China. Yeah, it's a huge number of, uh, especially in that area. Um, You know, in 1853 they captured Nanjing and um, you know set it up as the capital. But what's interesting here is we start to see Western military intervention. So the heavenly kingdom that was set up with uh, Hong being the heavenly king was, I would argue, bad for American business. Um, you think about it now, the stock market hates volatility. Um, generally speaking, like conflict mm-hmm. can be profitable for some people in a certain co- industrial complex. But 
like the volatility of it all, the stock market doesn't like volatility. The same thing, if you you have a very lucrative trade deal and suddenly the people that you the the empire that you just made that trade deal with and you have all of this this trade infrastructure set up with is suddenly threatened um, and the people that are setting up this heavenly kingdom are not necessarily pro trade with western powers you have a vested interest in intervening mm-hmm. to making sure that the the side that you made these agreements with wins so um you know the us ended up getting involved uh as well um so we had um someone named frederick townsend ward who began leading um he began leading the uh, ever victorious army and then eventually I was taken over by charles chinese gordon uh they were ended up, ended up being victorious uh yeah they it's a great nickname charles chinese gordon um yeah re- really creative <laughs> they ended up being victorious and defeating the the heavenly army um so these guys were fighting on the side of the qing they were fighting on the side of the Qing, yeah. So the Americans got involved and they tried to put, help put down this rebellion in order to regain stability. So I think looking back on this, part of the reason I think the Chinese now look back unfavorably on missionaries is the fact that this was partly inspired by Christian mission. It, it, they utilized, it was not Christianity yeah. what he was preaching, but he utilized pieces of Christianity and Confucian ideals and kind of melded it into his own. But a lot of the ideas of this mm-hmm. um, overthrowing of the current social order, proclaiming himself king and, and all of this has some similarities and kind of rings and rhymes with Christianity. So they look at that negatively and say, okay, this was partly caused a, by the, the Western powers intervention in manipulation of our stock market of our market, excuse me, not the stock market, the market. And then this spiritual aggression by these missionaries, giving these people all these ideas and causing all of this rebellion and disorder and chaos within our country. So I think that's part of the reason it's looked at very negatively. Plus 20 million people died. Yeah, it's and it's hard to distinguish between like, you know, if you're Confucian, you probably don't understand and don't care about the difference between like Protestantism versus Catholicism. Like it's just Christian. It's the white man's religion, right? Much less a guy who, uh, old Hong here, it's like he's saying Christian things. So you just lump him in with all the Christians uh, or rather lump all the Christians in with his rebellion. And uh, it especially is such a catastrophic event. It's hard to distinguish like, you know, Western influence from uh, 20 million dead Chinese people. Just for comparison, just so we understand this Taiping rebellion, because it's really hard to underestimate the gravity of uh, of this rebellion and its impact on Chinese history. We, we talked about in our last episode that China's population is, you know, roughly around the same size as the U S population today, a little bit bigger. Um, imagine if 20 million Americans died over the next 14 years, like, like that would be the most significant history in all, or sorry, this most significant event in all of American history. I mean, uh, 3000, just under 3000 people died in New York city on September 11th. And that completely changed everything. Imagine 20 million Americans dying in a 14 year period. Like our country would never be the same. And yet for China, we don't even like hear about it. <laughs> uh as if it's a thing. So this is the Taiping rebellion is huge uh for for China. It's also viewed as one of the first rebellions against imperialism, capitalism, western ideals and kind of the the genesis of a lot of their conflict. I think that's another reason Mao looks back on both the missionaries and the Taiping rebellion because it is for them in the the communist struggle against imperialism it is it is a key event that they do study and they learn a lot. So <clears throat> just to, to kind of recapture the the uh, the talk, so we, tying it to the key takeaways, we've talked about missionaries and their impact in China, talked about this, you know, the rebellion and how 
um, missionary work led into some rebellion and the, the effects of that rebellion and what was going on. And then, so let's, we've kind of looked at China for the, in this period. Let's take a look at Chinese American relations in, in the United States. The Taiping Rebellion, as this was occurring, caused a massive wave of Chinese immigration to the United States. Um, there were uh, what they called the Gum Sam or the Gold Mountain. So, so the, the gold rush of 1849 um, that drove a lot of Americans, uh, 49ers out west, um, also brought in Chinese uh, immigrants because they they thought that there was a lot of opportunity in the United States. So they would immigrate. And when they got to the United States, um, initially, you know, they were cheap labor that they were brought in. I'm not going to say that they were like welcomed, but a lot of, um, you know, since we're talking about like communism, capitalism, a lot of the the business owners and capitalists, like there was a lot of opportunity for them to work and they paid, they were willing to work for lower wages. So they were hired on and uh, brought in specifically around railroads, um, silver and gold mines. Um, and they would often compete with like Irish American workers. So these Chinese immigrants would, um, when they would get paid, they would send a lot of the money home. They would send the money to their sponsors who brought them. That was in right around 1852. There's about 30,000 uh, immigrants from 1852 to about 1860. And then by 1880, there's 100,000 Chinese immigrants. There's a couple key points that I want to talk about. So the first was with, you know, we talked about them getting hired on you know, railroads. So there's the Central Pacific Railway strike. This is a big strike that occurred out West and one of the first um, like labor movements and labor unions. So it was an eight day strike where these Chinese workers were demanding just better conditions, better work day, better work hours, better pay. They wanted to be, they wanted equal pay with their white counterparts. That strike ended. And then there was what was called the Berlin Game Treaty in 1868. And that actually encouraged Chinese immigration to the United States. So that was another, it was another trade agreement treaty. But one of the, the key facets of that was that it encouraged immigration to the United States. So for the next five years from the, the Burlingham Treaty to 1873, immigration began. Not a lot of problems. There are some of these strikes here and there. There was, there was discrimination at the local level, but by and large, Chinese immigrants kept coming. Then in 1873, there was a recession and it was a pretty bad. This is where I think things really start to shift politically. Um, you know, there was low level discrimination, there was discrimination at the job sites, things like that. But here now there is a, a shortage of labor of, uh, of jobs available and an uh, increase supply of labor available. So as Irish and white workers were competing against their Chinese counterparts for these jobs, tensions began to, to mount and spike. Um, so over the next 15 or so year, or excuse me, 10 to 15 years, there's a lot of these different acts that are passed that uh, ultimately culminate in the Chinese Exclusion Act. So there was Page Act, Homer Page that uh, championed it. It banned the immigration of Chinese women in order to discourage prostitution. Um, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 effectively ended the um, the mass immigration from China until like 1960. So, and then there was um, the Scott Act that was eventually passed in 1888 that basically is that like, if you go back to China, you can't come back here. So it was just another way that they could say like, okay, well, we're, we can't just kick them out. Let's say if they go back and visit family or they go back to China, they have to stay there. They can't come home. This period of time, like we kind of, the, Jay and I have been talking about this and like, hey, like the Chinese have a very negative view of the US involvement in China. Well, even here, we have a very negative view of the Chinese coming to the United States and it's vastly different um, like experiences in that when we were going to China and being involved in China, we were definitely the dominant, uh, the dominant party. We were coming in and we were enforcing our will, whereas Chinese immigrants were coming in at very unequal footing and they were at the low end of the totem pole, so to speak. And they were, they faced lots of discrimination. They faced a lot of prejudice and um, it's really the start of, and I think even the Chinese government looks at that, to this day and talks about U.S. discrimination against Chinese immigrants because they still viewed them as the people of China. It's one of it's one of the interesting twists of history because, you know, we've been we've been talking a lot about China and how Americans were treated in China and. The Americans were absolutely discriminated against in China, <laughs> right? Like it was, uh, it wasn't all hunky dory to be a missionary or a business person 
there, they may have not been working in the mines, but the the majority of Chinese people did not want them there. The Chinese government absolutely wanted them out and were doing different uh, things to try to get them out. Um, on the flip side, you had Chinese people in the United States and they were absolutely discriminated against. They were absolutely uh, treated uh, poorly relative to how other people were treated. And then the U S government stepped in and we wanted them out. And I guess like not, not trying to put modern day sensibilities on things that happened in the 1800s, but it's like, this is just the, this is defining the American and Chinese relationship all the way from the geopolitical to the everyday, like, um, you know, common people it's that there is a a clash of civilizations and we don't necessarily get along and if we want to get along it actually takes understanding hey this is this is why this person is here this is how we can you know understand their background and their culture etc so um yeah to me it's just like a like a twist of history here Jay, that's a great point about the, I think you put it great. That's a, it's a twist of history, but bringing it back to some of these key takeaways uh, from the business perspective, from the investing side, what was the U S doing, um, going back to China, what were we doing to invest in the Chinese economy to try and you know, make some money out of it? What were we doing? Point in time in the second half of the 1800s was when American businesses also started to invest in the Chinese economy, trying to make money. So we're capitalists. Uh, they, uh, you know, Mao may call us aggressive China or imperialists, but we were, might be more accurate to say we're aggressive American capitalists. <laughs> um, and b- real quick, before we talk about the details here, when we think about the American relationship with China today, um, it's almost its main driving factor is business, is capitalism. And so this, essentially, long story short, in the 1800s, American businesses like Standard Oil and Carnegie and JP Morgan, they tried to get break into the Chinese market and it didn't work. Um, Like we've literally been trying to uh, engage with the Chinese market for over a hundred years to varying levels of success. Like this is not a new problem. When we think about businesses, American businesses, like being nationalized by the Chinese intellectual property theft, etc. This has been going on for over a hundred years, folks. Um, and it's just, it's fascinating to me that some of these names that we were talking about in our last series, uh, you know, Rockefeller with standard oil, Morgan and Carnegie, like, they were involved in China too. So uh, when when the Treaty of Wangsha happened and we kind of were pushing for these open door policies, uh, American business was very, very quick to follow. As a matter of fact, one of the main uh, drivers for the Treaty, Treaty of Wangsha was American merchants going to the, uh, t- uh, I think it was the Tyler administration and saying like, hey, we want, we want, um, most favored nation status too. Uh, as as Colin, what you were talking about in our Standard Oil episode, Standard Oil had developed kerosene as a way to eliminate waste. Like kerosene was like a byproduct of their of their process, and they're like, "Well, let's sell it in lamps." <laughs> and it didn't. It, it like kind of worked in the U.S., but it wasn't that great. And they're like, "Well, let's try to sell it in China." <laughs> so they did, and it somewhat like it. It, it, it didn't do that great, but Standard Oil was trying to sell kerosene lamps uh, in China. Uh, J.P. Morgan and Andrew Carnegie got together and uh, founded an organization called the American China Development Company in 1895. And they like tried to build a railroad to connect like central and southern China. They only laid like some 30 miles of track and then were like, bump this, we're selling it to a Chinese businessman. <laughs> like it just wasn't working out. So there was these early, uh, yeah, there were these early attempts at trying to um, capitalize the Chinese economy. Uh, and to me, this is interesting because this is going to be a key theme that comes up over and over again. 
business is like defines our relation our relationship with China and that we are aggressive capitalists and business men and women in the in the West. So this is a, I'm going to read a quote from Anson Burlingame, the U.S. diplomat in 1868, who the Burlingame Tre- Burlingame Treaty is named after. There is no spot on earth where there has been greater progress made within the past few years than in the empire of China. She has expanded her trade. She has reformed her revenue system. She is changing her military. She has built or established a great school where modern science and foreign languages are to be taught. China now itself seeks the West. She has come forth to meet you. I think this is important because this is coming from an American talking about China. He is basically saying like, yeah, yeah, China's, China's, it's on the up and up. We know that the Qing dynasty was not on the up and up. This is not a good time for China. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's doing, on the it's down doing and down. Great. It's doing great. This, <laughs> mind you, this is four years after the end of the Taiping Rebellion where 20 people have died. But he, he's a diplomat coming in and saying like he – he recognizes the opportunity for expanded business, and that is what he's championing, both domestically in the U.S. and internationally in China. So, like we mentioned, the Burlingame Treaty encouraged Chinese immigration to the United States for labor, so the U.S. could expand. He also wants to open up. You know, the the Treaty of Tianjin was also signed recently, so it, it forced them to open more Western ports. This quote that I just read, I think encapsulate like the West view of saying like, okay, we're going to manage this relationship. We're going to manage the Chinese and it is going to be driven by business and trade. Like this is going to define the relationship and like, hey, all this great stuff that is happening as a byproduct. We are doing a, we are benefiting the Chinese through our business and trade. So like their view is not like the Chinese, like where it's a spiritual cultural war. We're viewing it as like a business transaction and like, Hey, all this good stuff is happening as a byproduct. So you're to your point, like this is going to happen over the next hundred and at this point, what 140 years or this interwoven, you know, we're looking at it as a business transaction. They're viewing it as a culture war. Yeah. It's I almost wish that I could, like if I could talk to Xi Jinping, this would never happen. <laughs> but if I could talk to Xi Jinping, it'd be like, be like, bro, we care. We, the United States, care about China, or sorry, we care about Taiwan because Taiwan is one of the world's largest semiconductor uh, uh, manufacturers in the entire world, and. If things go south, we are going to lose that market. Like it's a like idealism aside. Like we can always say, like we we want a free and open Indo Pacific. Like we demand that people have self determination and national sovereignty. And it's like okay, so they I'm can sure buy we our believe. Products. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Like that's it. It's like we we need their semiconductors. <laughs> like, it has everything to do with business in the market. And like, uh, maybe I'm being overly cynical here, but it's like, bro, like, just like, we know, we know Taiwan's part of China. We just want the semiconductors. <laughs> oh, and we want to be able to sell F-16s to them. <laughs> the, yeah. Yes, we need we need a perpetual state of potential conflict so we can sell them military goods. <laughs> oh well, man! It, oh lord! Don't open up that can of worms. Yeah, we're, we're, it's gonna it's gonna be opened. So it, <laughs> everybody thinks about the U.S. now, and we think like, wow, this military machine, this this mighty American military force, to include the Chinese and the Russians, they've studied it, and we are absolutely going to talk about what they think about the American military in a few episodes, but. One of the greatest weapons the U.S. can wield is its influence on economics. It, economics can influence. Think about it this way: We lost the Vietnam War. Like we are, Vietnam became a communist country. We lost. There are McDonald's all over in Vietnam. Like Vietnam now, I'm not going to say it's like super pro U.S., but it is. If you think about it, it is way more westernized. Now. They're pro American business. They're pro American business exactly, and that has a that effect. Like even the Chinese now, like the Chinese government is extremely restrictive because they're like, well, if we're going to make all this money, which we want to do, like we really have to do our best to limit this outside influence that is going to seep in to our country through the American 
corporate machine. Like I think people underestimate how powerful that is on influence. Like there's a, like there's American goods like Coca-Cola, McDonald's, all of these things in every single country all over the world. Like you cannot escape the American corporate empire. Like you cannot escape it. It is probably more powerful than the American military in its ability to influence like subtly. And I think that's another thing that's happening right right now. And I think the Chinese recognize this, even, you know, I, I'm not, I don't think, I think I've made the case that the Chinese recognize this back then. They recognize it as something that they don't want. Yeah. It is it is infringing on their culture. Well, and also one thing that American investors in particular bring to the table that other countries just can't muster, and that is the US dollar is the reserve currency, meaning it is more beneficial to make international transactions in US dollars. Well, when an American investor or investment company comes to you, modern day Chinese businessman, and you say, A, I want to invest in your company, like think Shark Tank type deal. Hey, I want to invest in your company. I'm going to give you a metric butt ton of US dollars to invest in your company. The Chinese dude's like, heck yeah. And they build up this company, they invest in the Chinese economy, and then all of a sudden the CCP's like, hey, this company belongs to us now. <laughs> <laughs> like it's this, they are more, the US wields tremendous influence by just the US dollar alone, like the 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 status that the US dollar has in the global economy and and the infusion of capital that we can put into foreign markets, it is very hard to turn down. I don't want to get too far ahead. I don't want to I don't want to jump ahead and start talking current events when we've been talking history this whole time, but the Chinese recognize the the influence the American economy and the American dollar wields through, you know corporations, things like that, they have also started fighting on that front too. Think think TikTok, think the algorithms that drive TikTok, think all of these things that they're trying to influence. So the Chinese recognize it and they are fighting that battle too. That is something that we're going to see when we get more into the, the current events and history more recently, but they do recognize it. So Jay, I think we're getting, <laughs> not to get way ahead into current events, but this all to go back, this all has ties back into the 1850s and 60s in China and these agreements that we we signed. Yep. Like I said, Jay, I think this is a good stopping point. I think we're going to get into the, the Boxer Rebellion and, and start getting into the turn of the, the turn of the 20th century in our next episode. But just to summarize what we talked about today, the Chinese view, this is not a conflict that is necessarily purely economic, purely military. It is for the spirit of of the Chinese people. It is their culture. It is their homeland. And this has effects that we're seeing today. This is, we are absolutely seeing this. We've seen the uh, Chinese leaders like Mao Zedong talk, discuss the spiritual war and affront that American imperialism brought. Karl Marx talks about it. So I think it's important for us to understand how we got here today because this period in Chinese history is, we don't even study it in America like we've mentioned, but in China, they absolutely study it. This century of humiliation that we're in the middle of right now has a lot of scar tissue for them. And what we discussed from the takeaways for this was the American missionary movement in China and the effects that it had, both good and bad, and the two schools of thought uh, around whether it was uh, imperialistic or purely neutral. Talked about the, the rebellion and that the initial first rebellion and kind of the push back against imperialism and um, even kind of ancient Chinese ideals and Confucianism. And then the effects that that had on um, immigration and how the Chinese were treated in the United States specifically, as well as uh, American business in interest and investment in China following some of these treaties in the Taiping Rebellion. So I think that's a really good stopping place and it starts to give a little more context um, as we move forward into the Boxer Rebellion and the, the turn of the 20th century. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. And dude, I am I am super excited to see where uh where the series goes. It's it is just so important to understanding today, like understanding US Chinese relations today. Uh and I've all, I'm already learning a ton uh for uh you know what's going on in the eighteen hundreds, um Taiping Taiping Rebellion in particular. Uh 
And I hope you, our listeners, are also learning a ton. <laughs> and uh, please let us know uh, if you enjoyed this episode. Uh, if you did, we would really appreciate a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, Podcast Addict, wherever you uh, listen to uh, this podcast. That really goes a long way in um, helping those those uh, uh, algorithms pick up uh, pick up this podcast, and we we greatly appreciate that. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Twitter at Loins of History. We're on Instagram at Loins of History. Facebook at Loins of History, uh, and. Um, you can give us feedback there. We always appreciate comments. You can tell us if you want us to change something. Uh, we're on YouTube and got some great feedback on YouTube from uh, from one of our listeners. And uh, yeah, so thank you for listening uh, to this episode of Ones of History. And we look forward to seeing y'all next week.